The following message is from King's Church 1066, based in Hastings, Bexhill and the surrounding area. For more information, head to our website, kings1066.org. Amazing. Can you stand with me if you're able to? I felt like we were just beginning to press in that bit deeper in worship. So if you feel up for this, why don't you just place your hand on your heart or just open your hands a way that you can just say, God, I'm I'm here for you right now. Yeah, Jesus. Jesus, we honour you today. There is none like you. And as we look at more of your nature and your character, God, We want our heads and our hearts to be impacted by who you are. And so we ask, Lord God, for each person here, wherever they're at with you, that they would come one step closer to knowing you today, Lord God, in thoughts, in mind, in comprehension, but in also love and action that surpasses our understanding and grabs our heart's attention. Jesus, come and show us who you are by your Holy Spirit today, we pray. Why don't you just pray for yourself for 30 seconds? Lord God, we don't want this to be a passive thing, Lord God. We want this to be an active thing. Lord God, come and show us more of you, Lord. Come and show us more of you. I really do believe the Holy Spirit just wants to fill again. Many of us here, as we're filled, the spirit of truth comes and reveals who God is to us. So I just pray that now, the spirit of God, would you come? Continue to come. Thank you, you're here. Continue to bubble up inside each one of us, Lord. Those that feel dry and empty, those going through it, Lord God, come in the way that only you can. Amen. Amen. Take your seats, but don't switch off. (laughs) So like Hannah said, we are back into our Behold series after a wonderful venue Sunday last week. And actually, like we just prayed, what we think about God, our theology and our understanding of who God reveals himself to be is so important. Right theology and and love for God go hand in hand as we get sent out to preach the good news. As we see Christians, maybe some of us here, go out and free people trapped in poverty, people trapped in slavery around the, around the world. Our understanding of God matters because it propels us out. It changes here and here. And from this place, it drives us out to live for Him. Amen. So today we're going to look at two things about who God is and we could spend our whole lives looking at these two things. So we're going to just simply skim the surface today. We're going to look at God being self-existent and God being unchanging. We're going to dart all around scripture. So do feel free to have your Bibles open or follow on the screen. So let's dive in, shall we? Are we ready? Our hearts are ready. Good. God is self-existent. He is complete in himself. He is independent. He has life in himself. The uncreated creator. He is full, complete, whole and holy. Holy means he is set apart. He is like none other. This is what God says about himself in Exodus when he reveals his his name to Moses in Exodus 3. He says, I am who I am, full stop. Jen, Jen Wilkin in her brilliant book, which I know some connect groups are going through at the moment, none like him. She says this, we as humans must confess I am because he is. Only God can say I am because I am. There's such a difference, right, between the creator and his created. Jesus says this as well in John 5, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to also have life in himself. How awesome. Kind of is awe-inspiring, isn't it, when we just think, God, you are self-existent. You have life in yourself. And because he's self-existent, that means he's self-reliant. 
So it means he doesn't need to rely on anything or anyone else. He is independent and self-reliant in who he is. Acts 17 says this, I love this. The God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and on earth, he does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life, breath and everything. Romans 11, for from him, through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So let's dive a bit deeper. What does this look like for God to be self-existent and self-reliant? Well, we serve a God that is God one in three, the, the beautiful doctrine of the Trinity. And guys, no analogy, no picture can ever describe what the Trinity is. One in three, it messes with our heads. We can't, we're not made to know fully that. We hold it in mystery, but we can delve a bit and we get glimpses through scripture of what our self-existent, self-reliant God is like in himself. So we see in the beginning in Genesis 1, come with me to Genesis 1, and we see it says, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And I know this is familiar to so many here, but we have to stand back and hold scripture and what God says and think, God, you were there. You have always been there. A few verses on, it talks about when God made man and it says, let us make him in our image. What a beautiful description of the Trinity, us and our. He has been there right at the start. In Jesus' baptism, it's one of my favourite parts of the Gospels. We see this most beautiful Trinity relationship at work. Jesus, as a, a man come down to earth, he's baptised. He goes under the water. As he comes up, the heavens open, enough for people to write down what they heard God say. And the Father says, this is my son. I love him. And in him, I am well pleased. And then the Spirit of God is sent from heaven to earth to fill the Son of God. I mean, what a moment to have witnessed. It's absolutely mind-blowing. Jesus says this when he prays, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory which I had with you before the world was made. Guys, for all eternity, past, present and future, we have a Trinity, God one in three, who is full and happy and delighting in himself. He is perfect in every way. The Father's saying, I love you, my son. I'm going to pour out all I am into you. I'm going to put my radiance on you. Jesus saying, Father, you and I are one. He's telling people, if you know me, you know my Father. Look at him. He's wonderful. I won't do anything my father doesn't tell me to do. And then you get the fellowship of the Spirit. Jesus filled with the Spirit, about to ascend back up to be at the right hand of his father. And he says, I'm going to send you my Spirit, the Spirit of truth. He's going to come to you. He's going to live, make our home in your heart. What a God. I love this quote by Mike Reeves. He says this, let this sink in. Indeed, the triune God is the love behind all loves, the life behind all life, the music behind all music, the beauty behind all beauty, and the joy behind all joy. Wow. Wow. We, it is right for us to be appropriately in awe and wonder of God and hold the mystery of knowing we will never be able to fully comprehend your completeness and your self-existingness, Lord. But what does this mean for us, right? So good, wow, you're fine on your own. <laughs> Is our life meaningless? Do we, does he need us? No, he doesn't need us. But oh my word, he wants us. Let's just look at a few things that are birthed out of the overflow of God's fullness and spill out into us creation. We have meaning, guys, because out of the fullness of God himself, he chose to create and to make. Not out of need or loneliness in him, but out of love, 
and delight and joy out of his fullness. The source of life speaks into the empty dark void and life comes. God said, let there be light and there was. Again, familiar verses, but guys, let's be in awe of this again. This shouldn't be normal or familiar. This is incredible. He cups dust from the earth and he forms man and he fills his breath into man. That is awesome. So because of who he is, out of the overflow, we are created. Creation happens. We're saved. We have the invitation of salvation out of the overflow of who he is. The nature of who God is as a self-existing God. There's a holy father who loves and sends a son who dies and rises again, and a spirit who reveals and brings life. We're forgiven and made righteous. And guys, that is only possible because he is self-existent. This is the gospel. It's all about him. He doesn't need our good works. He doesn't need any part of our love or our affection to be holy and wonderful and make the salvation story happen. It's all about him. And how often can we start to inch our way into that story? No, he's too holy. Salvation belongs to God alone. It's his grace, it's his mercy, it's his story, it's his love. We are saved because he is self-existent and independent and out of that, he flows salvation into the world. Not only are we saved, this is good news, right? Not only are we saved, we are adopted. Because of who God is, Father, Son, Spirit, He is a relational God. He has love in Himself. So it means that through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, to break the power of sin and death in our lives, we are now not only saved, but we're invited into this awesome, loving, triune God. We get to glimpse now these moments of the love of God. We experience it as we read the word, as we're filled with the Spirit. Oh my goodness, you are holy. And I get to see you because of Jesus. Oh my goodness, I'm loved because you are holy and I get to see you. Created, saved, adopted. And we're made, guys, to give him glory. It goes around in a full circle out of his glory. He makes us, saves us, adopted us so that we might bring him glory again. The father's very identity is centred around his love for his son. Jesus has and always will be about glorifying the father. The spirit fills us, like we said, so we can get caught up in this fellowship that our lives might be so dependent on giving him glory. We're not called to be God, right? But we're called to be godly. Guys, nothing makes us more godly than loving Jesus like he does. We're called not to be our own saviours, but to be Christ-like, right? We see that through scripture. Church, nothing makes us more Christ-like than how we love the Father. It's just so awesome that because of the Holy Spirit's work in our heart, we get to do this. Humans are dependent beings. I hope we can see that right now. (laughs) Created, saved, adopted to give glory. It's all about him. And the fight and the tussle comes for humans when we try and be independent. We try and save ourselves. We try and find that love that only adoption from God can can seal in our hearts. We try and give ourselves or other things glory. It's just the wrong way round. We were made to be wholly and completely dependent on the one who is independent. It's just the right way round. It's how God made it. When we understand a little bit more each day of the complete self-existingness of God, it calls out our need for dependency on him, right? Oh Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defence, 
my righteousness. Oh Lord, how I need you. Goes to him. Just going to pause for a moment and let some of that truth sink in. Are we fighting that tussle for independence in our hearts? Or this morning, can we take that step closer to saying, Lord, I can't, but you have and you can. About a year ago, you with me, guys? We're doing well. This is heavy stuff. It's good. About a year ago, uh, me and my family, we got to go to Slovenia which is very random, but it was absolutely beautiful. And I remember waking up one morning and we were literally in this little cabin lodge thing in the mountain peaks. It was honestly amazing. And I remember sitting there and just looking at the mountain and thinking, oh Lord, what would that have been like when you made it? And like, oh, I wonder what, like how long that mountain's been there for. And uh, it just got me thinking as I was preparing this, that mountain will change. It hasn't always been there. It won't always be there. And it will change with sun, erosion. I'm no geography teacher, but I can imagine it does change. As humans, we change, right? We age, we grow, we mature. Just life happens naturally. We change from stresses or situations of life. Change is inevitable for all creation. The stars have a limit. Our sun has a life and a beginning and an end. We serve a God who is unchanging. What is he? Unchanging. He is unchanging. Even what we were speaking about this morning, wars, just thinking about the devastation of that. In a moment, things can change. For whole countries, for individuals, diagnoses, just whole worlds turned upside down in a moment. We worship a God who never changes. He is of infinite sameness. Shall we delve into that together a bit just as we go through this second half? This is a blooming amazing quote by A.W. Pink. (laughs) So listen to this, it took me a while to get my head around. God exists forever and is always the same. He cannot change for the better for he is already perfect. And being perfect, he cannot change for the worse. He cannot change for the worse. Oh Lord, just help us grapple with this in our hearts, we pray. Yeah. So we're going to look at five ways in which God is unlike us. And uh, yeah, let's dive in as we whip through. So God is unchanging in his life. We've looked at that a bit with his um, self-existing nature. It's Psalm 102 says, But you, God, remain the same. Your years will never end. Do you know what? I go up and down like a yo-yo. My life, good, bad, tough changes, heartbreaking situations, I'm sure you can relate. But actually, our God, He remains the same, like a stake in the ground. He is immovable and unchangeable. Like just reminded of uh, Peter and Jesus when Peter's walking on the water, he's walking on the choppy sea and he looks down at the sea and it's like a parallel of life situations. And actually Jesus says, no, Peter, look at me. Look at me. And Jesus stands there on the water. Again, just unchanged, immovable. Come, look at me. In God's character, he is unchangeable. So (laughs) literally thank God that he cares enough about me to change me. Because honestly, left to my own devices without God, my character is appalling. And I'm going to let you into some of that now. (laughs) So, like I said a minute ago, I can be all over the place with my emotions, even my feelings towards my family. I adore them. But you know, sometimes, even in marriage prep, I think we had it, sometimes you will have to choose to love them. And um, that is so that is so true, right? Even those closest to us, through gritted teeth, it's like, I am choosing to love you right now. This is what, <laughs> love you, Jenna. This is what the Bible says. Lamentations 3, God's love is unchanging and steady. In Romans it says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And just referring back to earlier, He is always loving because of who He is as Trinity God, right? Love is in who He is, Father, Son, Spirit, so He cannot change. He will always be loving. I've let a lot of people down in my life. I'm sorry, probably some of you in this room. But actually it says about God's faithfulness. His faithfulness is everlasting and unchanging. 
I sin and I mess up. God cannot sin. He will always hate it. It says in Psalm 5, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness and no evil dwells in you. I struggle to be merciful and show justice. I can be really quick to anger and very, very poor in loving. And David says of God, the Lord is merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and he is rich in love. Guys, I could go on and on. All he's revealed to us in scripture, all he's revealed to us is who he is, was and will always be. He won't grow older or younger. He won't grow wiser or weaker or stronger. He won't mature or develop. He doesn't gain or lose power. He doesn't become less or more truthful or more loving or less perfect or more just. He is who He is who He is. He is holy and perfect and complete in His character. Yes, thank you, Lord. It's these beautiful layers of fullness of God's character. Paul Wordsworthy was so helpful with me this week. We often can think of who God is like a patchwork quilt. Like, oh, corner of love, a bit of holiness in here. No, no, that's far too human. He is full to the measure of every single aspect of his character. And it is so vital that we don't just cushion in under the quilt or like, oh, God loves me. But we stand back and we think, you are holy and I will never get my mind around you. And that is why I get down on my knees and I worship you, Lord. So he's unchanging in his life, in his character. God's truth is unchanging. I flick through the BBC News app most days on my phone, a little bit on social media sometime. I don't know about you can relate, but our brain within maybe like 10 minutes of flicking is filled with news, fake news, her truth, his opinion, scientific discovery over here, some horrible uh, truth that's just come out about something hidden for years over there. And even in myself, let alone the world, I change all the time. Oh my word, when I think of the things that I've said in the past, I'm ashamed. Just some of my thoughts or things where I've thankfully just grown and matured in God, I think I am just constantly changing and my truth is not the truth. But yet we know the one who is the truth, right? Let's just look at the Bible for this. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Church, his word, his truth, his covenants, his promises, they are unchanging. They will not be moved. God's purpose is unchanging. It's a big human question, right? What's the meaning of life? And then what's my purpose? I think I've done a variety of jobs in my life. (laughs) I've gone from changing 30 nappies a day in a nursery and standing there thinking, what am I doing with my life? To pouring Guinness really badly in a pub at uni. I still don't know what I'm doing with a lot of my life, to be honest, but God knows who he is and what his plans are. The plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. What's his purpose? What's his big plan that's been unchanging from beginning to end? That he is revealed to his creation. That we might know him. His eternal purpose, Ephesians says, that was realised in Jesus Christ, our Lord. (laughs) that he would be made known through creation, through his spirit and through his son, that we might know him. We also have purpose in that as individuals, right? In him, we've been chosen before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless. Our purpose to therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And in Psalms, we read every one of our days is written out by him. We have purpose, guys, in the God who has unchanging purpose. And finally, we see through Scripture the unchanging nature displayed in the Son of God. 
Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Can we just get the band up if that's all right? That'd be amazing because we'd love to just respond and worship in a minute. Hebrews says this, it's a beautiful picture as I've been preparing, I've just been really holding on to this week. Hebrews 6, 19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. We have this hope, Jesus Christ, the anchor of our souls, who has died and risen again, is it's now seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father, who lives to intercede for us. We have a hope. For those who know Jesus, we have a hope. For those who don't yet know Him today, you can have a hope in Jesus as you put your trust and your faith in all He says He is. Through the life's ups and downs, through the heartbreaking times, the times of change, the times of just, God, where are you? What are you doing? We have a God who is independent and overflowing in love, but who's also holy and unchanging. And we, we walk knowing him in his holiness and in his love. We walk knowing him <laughs> until the day where we'll get to see Jesus Christ face to face. And we'll see that in him, all the fullness of God dwells as we look on him. What purpose, what, what bigger purpose can we have than running towards that day with all we've got, right? <laughs> then running to Jesus, running to him, living for him, asking the Spirit, convict me, help me change me to be more like you. Help me love the Father. Help me love the Son. Help me honour the Spirit in my life. Our theology about God matters because of the overflow. It impacts who we are and what we should be about. I'd love to invite you to stand. We've got a load of time now just to worship, adore. And I, I feel for some of us, it's easy to switch off in this series and think, you know, I'm not very intelligent. I'm, I can't ever get some of this, so I just back off. This is a call this morning to say, come and know me from the Lord. Come and know me. Come and be in awe of me again. You know, we, we can have the mind of Christ because of Jesus. So it means that we can have beautiful thoughts of God because we have the mind of Christ. For some of you, you feel maybe distant from God or maybe you don't know him yet. This morning, you can take a step closer into knowing God. So we're going to sing about and then we're just going to be open to see what the Spirit of God wants to reveal to us, what he wants to do in us. So I'd encourage you, just give your all to Jesus again right now. Allow your minds to be blown and now your knees to be bent down. Feel free to move out, find space and just have some time with God in the context of church life. Yeah, Father, we adore you. We want to be in awe of you, in fear of you, the self-existing one. But yet know that you call us in to your love. You call us to know you. Jesus, come minister to our hearts right now. We ask in your name. Amen.